Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your host, Aaron Dykes. This is the InfoWars Nightly News. Tonight, reporter Patrick Henningsen unleashes bombshell quote from SPLC head Mark Potok, where he claims there is no hate speech. This from an organization that claims that those who don't bow down to the government are inciting hate. Plus, Mike Adams joins us in studio to talk about the gross injustice of Agenda 21 and its emerging effects on small-town America. Then, TSA whistleblower claims that agents fear radiation from naked body scanners. We'll also cover today's top headlines and more tonight on the InfoWars Nightly News. At the top of our news stack tonight, our reporter Patrick Kenningson has developed sources inside the Sanford Police Department, uh, as well as other sources he, co he has compiled to show Zimmerman will most likely not be arrested for first degree murder. They are not planning to get together a grand jury. And he's also uncovered disinformation about supposed neo Nazi groups patrolling around the Orlando, Sanford, Florida area, proving that that has all been a hoax, and yet the media ran with it. But breaking news he's brought to us earlier today on the show, he's going to elaborate on, is the conversation he had with Mark Potok of the SPLC saying there is no hate speech, at least not when it comes to the new Black Panther group. Patrick, thank Thanks for joining us. Well, good to be with you, Aaron. And of course, we see this Trayvon Martin case continuing to spiral into a national debate. Uh, some have pointed out that they're trying to stir up a race war. At the very least, they're trying to punch our buttons and distract us in time for the elections, keep our mind off of the larger looting going on throughout this ongoing economic crisis. Absolutely. That's exactly what's going on. But worse than that, Aaron, they're going to take us into a whirlpool of social division and apply something that appeals to the lowest common denominators on both the far right wing and also on the far left wing and so it's it's bad it's bad enough that they uh, just this is providing a distraction that's run for over a month it's dominating every major media outlet i'm talking about newspapers television national news cable news uh, the Trayvon Martin, George Zimmerman media circus has just taken over. And now they're using it, the opportunists on the left-leaning side, uh, in terms of Al Sharpton and uh, the Jeremiah Wrights and the Barack Obamas and the R Rachel Maddows of the world, will take this and use it to further make a divide. It's an election year, Aaron. It's 2012. So uh, cheap political points are looking to be scored. And then on the far right, you have the uh, bankrupt... Uh, totally irrelevant neo-Nazi group. And also, I, I'll, I will put the new Black Panther Party on the far right, actually. Um, they're totally irrelevant. Both of those groups probably have uh, federal, either CIA or FBI informants uh, embedded at the highest level of the organization in order to steer their radical agendas. Yeah, I want to make that clear out of the gates because history shows, particularly these neo-Nazi groups, always are steered by these FBI informants, these provocateurs, get a couple of, of, of yokels in the group to make it look like something's happening. And in fact, in the Orlando area back in 2006, there was a big splash over a neo-Nazi rally where they deliberately marched through the black community to try to stir up sentiments. And it turned out the leader of the group was this guy, David Gleddy, an FBI agent agent, an informant, a provocateur, and yet many of these neo-Nazis continued to support him even when he was exposed. And I saw a similar thing, actually, at a rally in Austin. I saw footage of it from a few years ago where you had a handful of these neo-Nazis and thousands of people in the crowd shouting them down, really buying into the very division they're trying to sell us. Sure. You have the same thing with the anarchist groups, that they uh, bus out to the G20 or to the G8 protests, and these are people who were phallic lavas over their face, and also some of them uh, are police officers. You can see the uh, police issue boots and, and also military issue boots and so forth. That's, that's no surprise to anybody. But look, um, our good friend Bill Ayers, who uh, is linked with uh, organizations like the Ford Foundation, you know, the Ford Foundation was created to subvert labor unions, for one, uh, all over the world. And also, they're, they're very tight links with the CIA. So our good friend Bill Ayers, who has built up this beautiful reputation as a radical leftist, the people like Sean Hannity, who 
have no brain activity at all, or buying into the Bill Ayers radical left myth, when in fact Bill Ayers, most likely, I will bet, I'll bet the car and the house, the Bill Ayers is a informant. He's an embedded individual, because if he wasn't, for the bombings and the horrible crimes that he's taken part in conspiring, he'd be doing back-to-back -back life sentences in a place like Terre Haute, Indiana Federal Penitentiary. And of course, there's documentaries on the Weather Underground showing that numerous, numerous people inside that group were informants, others, I guess, useful idiots. But yeah, as you say, it's not that he's truly radical left or pushing the kind of class war or racial division that the Weather Underground pushed in those days. They're actually basically elitist. They're connected with Wall Street bankers and, yeah, part of this Ford Foundation system that Obama eventually grew out of. And you've got skull and bones people like McGeorge Bundy running the Ford Foundation programs where they deliberately chose to fund radical black groups and other minority groups instead of uh, much more tame groups who may have actually been able to accomplish some good things. Yeah, it, they're obsessed with controlling both sides of the conversation. They're obsessed with controlling both sides of the paradigm. It's it's a lot like, you know, when you, when you go into a casino and you go to play at the blackjack table or whatever, uh, every, that's us. We're, we're the guys on the, on the, making the bets they, they they run both sides of the game the casino the house is the only person who ever makes a profit in that equation and that's exactly what we have with what unfortunately we have in america is a uh, total society that's run and directed by uh, dozens in fact hundreds of foundations and ngos and this is now spread all over the world uh, and you'll see it in almost every country on the planet uh, it's being done a clandestine agenda of social engineering which is being achieved uh, quite quite efficiently, I might add, through the various foundations, through the Open Society Institute, through the Tides, through the Rockefeller Foundation, the Ford Foundation here in America. And we know how this mechanism works because we've studied history, but back to the Trayvon shooting case, why did this become such a media outburst? I mean, you had the Oscar Grant uh, killing uh, on the train system over there. There was outrage over that, but not anywhere near the same level. And we saw that cop serve, I think, one year at the most, maybe two years, and go off scot-free. The, the black community and the community at large forgot all about him, but they're up in arms over this Trayvon thing. We know it's been socially engineered, but let's get back into specifically why. What have you found, and what happened when you talked to Mark Potok? <laughs> well, uh, you know, the reason I got into this story at the beginning, Aaron, is because uh, I, I, I'm on the mailing list. Uh, I get news alerts from from the, the right wing uh, political side of the spectrum and also from the left wing. And I, I sign up to everybody's alerts because I want to see what's going on at all times. And uh, I got this one news alert from a incredibly Democrat Party oriented uh supposedly news website uh, out of Los Angeles called LA Progressive. Okay, they're very nice people who run this site. They're very well-intentioned, very well-meaning. Anyway, Julie Driscoll, who is this fire-breathing uh, liberal blogger um, and a gatekeeper of sorts, and I chronicled this in my article on Infowars.com today, she ran with the neo-Nazi, the armed neo-Nazis patrolling the streets of Sanford. And I had a bit of an argument with the editor I said, I said, you know, you guys should be ashamed of yourself. You're helping to promote a race war. And this is one journalist talking to another, okay? We had this private conversation um, over the weekend. And uh, he said, well, it's, it's because of racial profiling. This is an opportunity to bring the, the, the issue of racial profiling to the fore. And I'm saying to myself, what racial profiling? You know, the, uh, how can the media or the mob the populist mob decide what the elements are of any criminal case. This should be uh, something for the police and for the courts. And then the liberal will come back to you and say, well, the police didn't do anything, the courts didn't do anything. It was only because of public outrage. Well, Aaron, what this is quite simply is was an easy target because there was a young uh, teenage boy and they've got all his, his child pictures. They don't have any pictures of how old he was when he actually was shot. And, that's another thing on its own, is the media presentation of this case. But it's an easy opportunity for uh, the, the, the real detritus of the political world. I'm talking about people like Al Sharpton or some of these other liberal pundits or the Chris Matthews of the world uh, in, in election year in order to score cheap points. And look what they've done. They're pushing America 
towards uh, in the direction of a race war. And I think shame on anybody in the media uh, who's, who's contributing to that. There's old ladies getting tasered. Infowars.com has hundreds of examples over the last year of old ladies getting tasered, people getting beaten, pulled out of wheelchairs, abused by police. This is happening to all of us, Aaron, in America. It's not just black people. It's not just Hispanics. It's whites. It's everybody. This is, this is our new police state. That's true, it's coming home to roost, but specifically, they were caught pushing this fake neo-Nazi story and the media ran with it. They not only played the race card, they stuffed the deck with so many race cards you can't look any other direction. Sure, I, I and actually, I, I, I phoned the Southern Poverty Law Center uh, and I spoke to Mark Potak, who's uh, in charge there, and he is the Grand Master of the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center. And I said to him, what's going on down there in Sanford? Are there neo-Nazis or not? I wanted to get confirmation from Mark because I had seen this on the Southern Poverty Law Center's website. And he told me, he, and quite rightly, I have to give him credit, he said, no, there's no reports of that. Uh, he was kind of muffled about that rebuttal there. Um, that, that original story has since been retracted by the Miami New Times, by the way. Um, and anybody can just call the police department in Sanford, Florida, and they'll tell you if there's been any reports, and uh, there haven't. So, and I said to, uh, I said to Mr. Potok, I said, hey, um, had a good conversation about legal uh, aspects of what's going on and also about the history of neo-Nazis. And he filled me in on quite a few interesting uh, characters and so forth that they keep track of. And I said, well, what about the new Black Panther movement? I said, they've gone on Miami radio. They're calling for blood in the streets. We're going to get sued and we're going to get booted and we're going to see blood on the streets. They are calling for a race war, literally, and also have put a bounty on George Zimmerman's head. Okay. So I said, is this hate speech? Could we could can we arrest these people? This is a bit dangerous. And Mark Potok's uh, exact words to me were, "There's no such thing as hate speech." And that was a quote that just blew me away, Aaron. I don't know what to say. Um, he said that it would have to be an immediate threat. In other words, hate hate speech in their eyes, as he referred to my question, only applies to when you're standing across the road at a like if I was a a Black Panther across the road, and there were Ku Klux Klan across the road, and someone yelled uh, in some remark that incited violence. And of course, you're discussing hate speech to point out the hypocrisy, because it's this issue they're trying to brew up to pass ridiculous laws to restrict the First Amendment. There's already laws on the books about making threats against someone's life, threatening violence, trying to carry it out. Uh, here's one of the posters they brought up for the murder of Trayvon Martin, $10,000 reward. Dead or alive, isn't that what they said? Yep, that's what they said. You know, I think it's pretty good indication, Aaron, here. Uh, let's use our powers of deductive reasoning. If the Black Panther leader, uh, Mr. Malik, um, whatever his last name is, um, if he's calling for this on, the, on, on radio, and this is on record, um, and he's not being arrested, I think that's a pretty, pretty uh, certain indication that he is uh, a federal uh, informant or a plant or a tool of some sort. Because if it was somebody who wasn't part, wasn't registered with the federal government, if they went and said that, that sh the station would be shut down, they would be arrested, and they would be put in jail, and there would be protests on the streets like you've never seen, okay? And not but to I mention everyone else speaking out against this should say, hey, don't go there. You're going to discredit the critique we're trying to make. It just shows how much of it is disingenuous from the start. Uh, now, I just want to shift gears, though, because if Zimmerman did something wrong, he should have justice, but they pretty much decided not to go with a grand jury. At the same time, you found from your sources inside the police department in Sanford, they really want to go after the Stand Your Ground uh, Second Amendment defense clause in Florida. Uh, can you flesh that out for us? Yeah, it's not exactly my uh, sources in the police department. It's a, that is from a judge in the Central Florida court who's very close to the prosecutor's office. Sure. I won't mention their name because I'd like to keep their identity anonymous for obvious reasons, but they indicated to me that uh, the Zimmerman trial in a grand jury, uh, according to the inside sources, is too tough a sell. In other words, it, it's almost impossible. Not only that, 
uh, Florida law stipulates that only a first degree murder uh, charge can warrant a grand jury investigation. So it doesn't look like it's going to happen. You know, within the pros within the uh, parameters of the law, uh, George Zimmerman is not getting off scot free. It's it is what it is, and it would have been the same with any other incident. The public fervor behind and around all of this incident makes it something else. So there will be political pressure put to bear on that uh, special prosecutor there and also on the Florida legal system. That political pressure will most likely result, according to my uh, source who's a judge in this court system, is that they will revisit the stand your ground law. In other words, they're going to probably have to rewrite this law because of public pressure, which is a kind of a sad thing in itself that has come to that. But it'll be retreat first, retreat first, and then stand your ground. So it's a new way to define self-defense. That's where the conversation is going. The, the higher-ups, the engineers, that's where they're taking it. We're giving you a little insight into that now. So just wait in the weeks and months to come, and you'll see these exact talking points coming out. So we've done that here at InfoWars. And we already have, but Obama has promised to sneak attack the Second Amendment. Uh, he was quoted telling the Brady Center, something very close to that effect. We've seen the Fast and Furious stuff unfold, but if they do pursue stand your ground, especially leading up to an election, it's just A plus B is C for Obama to to, in, to cite Trayvon, who has already said would have been his son if he had a son, uh, to cite the stand your ground, how wrong he thinks it is, and to push for some form of gun control, whatever it is they think they can get their hands around, around that issue. What do you think? You know, you're absolutely correct in that analysis. And what this will be is if there will be enough pressure to kind of redefine self-defense laws in America, that is a nice entree into restricting uh, the use of firearms. And of course, that is even knocking on the door of the Second Amendment right there. And that is something that Obama can only really go for in his second term uh, when he is reelected. And by the looks of the uh, GOP circus at the moment, it's almost a certainty Obama- Almost will, a certainty. It will get almost a certainty he will get his second term. So uh, this Trayvon Martin thing has really softened the ground around the Second Amendment uh, in order to make that possible and for the, the federal uh, executive order signing statement machine to be sprung into action uh, and to sort of go around the Supreme Court, go under it. As Nancy Pelosi said, we're going to pole vault over it, we're going to dig under it, or we're going to knock the fence down, but we're going to get in. And uh, that's basically what you're going to see more of uh, after uh, next January. It's sick, Patrick. They always go after the First Amendment, the Second Amendment. They've done so much to the Fourth, Fifth, on and on. What's next? A return to quartering of troops, the Third Amendment? Uh, I mean, it's just sick how much they attack our basic principles under the Bill of Rights. Uh, your well, words in closing here. Well, my words in closing was one of the most uh, worrying things I've seen was when I was watching PBS the public broadcasting system. And there was a special program on called Finding Your Roots. And this was in a, I believe it was a New England uh, high school classroom. And we had uh, white children and black children together in class and a black professor who was focusing on this uh, history of, of the founding fathers and, and really highlighting George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. And these were all slave owners. And uh, he was giving this information to the children. And, he, and they said, what do you think about your founding fathers now? And the kids were like, well, that's, they're not very good. They're part of the problem. Quote, they're part of the problem. Anybody can watch this kind of disturbing uh, PBS program that's made dressed up to be a nice kind of um, happy, liberal, progressive, Coney 2012 kind of we all get together mm -hmm. program. But it's quite it's quite damaging. So in in in, re, in really there you can throw out the Constitution along this line of thinking because the founding fathers were slave owners, and so anything that America did in its history is wrong and bad, and you know and de using white and black again uh, is is divisive uh, tool to divide people into their respective social quarters. It's it's disgusting. This country has come a long way in 250 years, and there are a few people who are determined. Who I think they hate America or something.
because they want to bring us right back. And definitely a lot of wrong stuff happened to the black community in particular and lots of people, but the first laws to restrict the Second Amendment were to keep black free people from owning guns, uh, to keep them disarmed as they got out of slavery and moved through that terrible Jim Crow period and the rest of it. Anyway, a big topic. We won't get all into it here. Keep your eye on this issue, Patrick, because we can see the ways they're trying to develop it, and we'll speak to you in the near future. Thanks for joining us tonight Thank on the InfoWars Nightly News. We'll be back after this with the rest of the news, and we'll throw it a break here. Uh, we, we're going to show you some of the police state four footage during these breaks. We're going to show you contest entries later, as well as our regular stuff. So watch the breaks, too. Thanks for tuning in. The InfoWars Nightly News, we need your support to stop everything they're trying to do to destroy our way of life. our biggest contest ever and we're looking for people who love freedom and who want to be all in in the resistance to tyrants so you say you want to fight the new world order why if you were on the radio if you were Alex Jones you'd really kick some globalist ass well here's your chance we're hiring not one but two new reporters whose reports are going to be on the radio, whose reports are going to be on the nightly news, who will even anchor the show. If you're ready, here's your chance to step into my shoes, and I hope you surpass what I've done. Two winners, $10,000 in prizes, and a shot to be a reporter inside the InfoWars.com command center. We're looking to hire one male reporter and one female reporter. And when you win, you win $5,000. Your video gets seen by hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people on YouTube. And you get put into the very front of the running to be hired as a reporter slash anchor right here in our operation. Do you have what it takes to be the next Info Warrior? The rules are posted below me here and at InfoWars.com. This is a big deal. You know, the globalists are expanding their global empire, but at the same time, the people are waking up all over the world. We've expanded our operations in the last year. We've added the nightly news five nights a week. We're making more special reports. We're reaching 15 million people every week. In a year, I want that to be 30 million. This is your chance to join the team. I want to see what you can do. But a big hint is this. Can your news piece make the news? Does it get people's attention? Does it educate people? Does it open minds? That's more important than being beautiful or speaking with perfect eloquence as an orator. All of that is important, but we're looking for people that have that magic spark, that fire of liberty in their heart, because I want you to join our team. I want to give you a launch pad so you can really take off and engage the globalist. And if this works, we'll have contests all the time and we'll continue to build this operation. I'm involved in a talent search looking for people who have the fires of liberty burning in their hearts and their minds. You've got until April 30th to complete your news report and then we'll announce the winners one week later. Are you going to join the info war? Do you have what it takes? It's up to you. All serious entries will be posted on InfoWars.com. So everybody wins. You're getting the message of liberty out, and that's what really matters. But in the final equation, it's not about showing Alex Jones what you got. It's about showing the world and the globalist that no army can stop an idea whose time has come. Join me in the InfoWar. So you say you want to fight the info war. You say you want to go head up against the new world order. You can do a better job than Alex Jones. I know you can. And here's your chance to prove your mettle.
really enjoy it when the globalists try to poison us and uh, well, we resist them via a free market system. Hello, my fellow info warriors. Alex Jones here introducing you to the pro pure family of gravity fed filters. Now, you know that the globalists are filling our water with radioactive isotopes, fluoride, lead, mercury, arsenic. And one of the few systems that can efficiently and economically remove or reduce down to non detectable levels these poisons are gravity fed filters. And ProPure is the top of the line. Their filters are impregnated with silver, a natural antibiotic. On top of that, they're bigger, so they filter faster. You don't have to prime these the first time you use them. It's amazing. Go to InfoWars.com and click on the shopping cart link uh, to see the entire family of these babies. Now, the fluoride they add to our water is so tiny that most filters can't cut it out. But ProPure has their system that will, again, reduce it to non-detectable levels, almost get all of it out of there. That's also available. And if you look at the different systems they offer, the Pro Pure Big Brush Finish is on a stand, so it's easier on a table or at your restaurant or wherever you have it to go up with a glass or a mug and fill it up. Then there's this big baby right here, the Pro Pure King Large version. Got a lot of different options that come with it. Also, they have the Pro Pure Big, probably one of the best values out there. And of course, it's burnished stainless steel. And then what I use on my RV, something that's great for your hunting cabin or the back porch is the Pro Pure Traveler. Small and portable, but packs a huge punch, cleans out all that garbage. They also have a glass sight spigot, so you don't have to take the top off and look in the bottom area to see how much water. You can see how fast it's filtering with this optional uh, system. The globalist obviously are hitting us through our water. It's time to take control of our lives. It's time to not give our children and families these poisons. And these systems cut it down to non-detectable levels across the board. ProPure is the name. I only promote what I believe in. And I use ProPure in my home and my office. And I recommend that you check out the information on ProPure at InfoWars.com. We already have the lowest price at InfoWars.com on the ProPure Gravity Filter System. But when you add in the 10% off when InfoWarriors use the product code WATER at InfoWars.com, nobody can top it. So again, it's a win-win-win. Stop drinking the poison water. Uh, checkmate the globalists when it comes to your health and support InfoWars.com and the work we're doing here. You know, many revolutionaries rob banks and things and kidnap people for funds. We promote in the free market the products we use that are about preparedness. That's how we fund this revolution against the new world order in our move to restore our constitutional republic and a spirit of 1776 worldwide. Check it out at InfoWars.com. Pro Pure, top of the line, number one, most powerful and effective and economical gravity fed water system in the world. Pro Pure, available, discounted at InfoWars.com. Don't forget product code WATER to save 10%. It's the latest generation, years in development. Pro Pure is the name. Ehrlich. I'm Aaron Dykes. We are back from break on the InfoWars Nightly News. Come on, man. Let's do this. Do I, should I say my name a little slower? No, just say welcome back. Welcome back. I'm your host, Aaron Dykes, on the InfoWars Nightly News. Now, we talked before about the escalating police state, and unfortunately, there's just more and more evidence of it. As we go into that, I want to remind you in our daily quote of the words of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, and that is that those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. And we turn now to our news and see that this is, in fact, surely happening because new microchip knows your location to within centimeters. Uh, that's on new smartphones, a new chip they're going to be putting in there. Forget the chip on your forehead, Paul Joseph Watson writes. Uh, it's going to be in your phone, and it can track you down to just a few uh, centimeters, less than inches, less than feet. It will know what floor you're on in buildings. It's going to totally track you. And just remember, all these cell phone companies already got caught secretly tracking the logs 
Uh, they've also had police departments, uh, especially in the UK, I think also in the US, who've been taking cell phone data from drivers on routine stops without a warrant and surely doing that as well from various types of suspects. With the effort to legally establish surveillance drones further, the efforts to legally establish surveillance drones as a legitimate tool in domestic law enforcement uh, could aid authorities in saving a lot of time and money, especially if they can just ask the f cell phone companies for a log of all the location data. And if they're taking the cell phone data, as we've already discussed, how much would it take for them to put together a total tracking timeline for anyone who's a suspect or a political dissident or anyone else they want to put on the sidelines? And indeed, you've got Apple, Google, Microsoft, all the other companies working behind the scenes with law enforcement to make it happen just takes us one step closer. Meanwhile, ordinary American life, forget it. They're cracking down on that too. What's going on in Roswell? Not aliens. We're talking about Roswell, Georgia, where Andrew Words is now dead after more than four years of harassment over his backyard chickens. He was finally uh, evicted via county marshals. There's some kind of explosion. It resulted in the loss of his life. A real tragedy there and a real encroachment on on rights. Rob Dew and Mike Adams from Natural News, who hosted the show today, are going to get into that in detail in an interview coming up. But just another outrageous case. Meanwhile, photos have surfaced from training by the U.S. Army to do riot control. We've got a photo montage of that. There's a similar exercise by the National Guard from May 2010. And of course, we already knew from 2008 that the Army War College, as you see these photos of them getting ready for people begging for food, demanding to be let in to what, I guess, FEMA facilities to get their food rations. Well, uh, you've got the IMF warning of economic riots back in 2008. You've got the Army War College warning that the country must prepare for civil unrest. This has been brewing for some time. They know that this economic crisis is going to go on and on, and people are going to get more and more desperate. Notice that sign, food now. So in this training exercise, as you see these photos, you've got them specifically doing a hunger game, expecting people to be starving and desperate and ready to turn themselves into government for anything they can get. But they're going to set up riot control police, and you probably won't even get what you were promised, even if you give in to government. Meanwhile, you've got U.S. protesters increasingly being treated like terrorists under Israeli-style repression. You've got Press TV interviewing an American. His name is Ro Alan Rowland, discussing how the cops who are pepper spraying college students and clamping down on them and treating them like they're some kind of unrest uh, element just because they're protesting things like student tuition, love, hate, or indifferent to the issue, they are being treated under these counterterrorism measures. And why are police being trained by Mossad agents as though we're dealing with terrorists? Well, it just shows the response that they really want to end this country, clamp down on dissidents of all kind. And in fact, uh, it just sprang to mind one small example from back in 2008, where here in Austin, Texas, you had counterterrorism experts from Israel coming to train our police forces here in the country. I've got that article here from News 8 Austin, again from two years ago, but it just shows how you've got a country in a volatile part of the world, a definite clash of cultures between Israeli lifestyle and the other countries in the Middle East, where certainly they have violence. And indeed, they quote in this article, the Israeli people grow up to think in the back of their heads something is always out to harm them, so they're very careful. goes on to say how they're very used to dealing with the stress of terror, but they're essentially transplanting that here in the United States, bringing that terror home. They could have ended the war on terror, started for bogus fraudulent reasons in the first place years ago, but instead they decided to turn the tables, label returning veterans, uh, spy upon dissidents, question political speech, question those with bumper stickers, question supporters of Ron Paul and the other third party candidates, and now they've got the riot police in position to clamp down on society with that larger brand, that regular American life is somehow now terrorism. And it's not even just political activity, it's lemonade stands and all the rest of it. These backyard chickens, it just makes me sick.
And so next in our news stack is more calls for global government and for global population control. Urian Massan's article, Ehrlich Hansen Lovelock, we must build an entirely new kind of global society. And so you've got the United Nations Environmental Program, who's published their, quote, key messages from these top eugenicists, from these top uh, climate change advocates saying it's all man-made. That's Paul Ehrlich, who worked with John P. Holdren, who's currently in the White House. He's the one who wrote Population Bomb, itself an overdriven model to sell people on population control. You've got the climate guy, James Lovelock, who says we should have fewer than a billion people, ideally. And you've got NASA's James Hansen, who's always running scrimmage for the data, trying to sell the public on it. And they say in their new report, Environment and Developing Changes, the Imperative to Act, uh, that the UN uh, at its upcoming 2012 Earth Summit should push for global government population control. Globally, we must find a better means to agree and implement measures to achieve collective goals. They go on to say, in the face of an absolutely unprecedented emergency, society has no choice but to take dramatic action to avert a collapse of civilization. Either we will change our ways and build an entirely new kind of global society, or they will be changed for us. Does this sound familiar? We just covered this yesterday in the Peak Civilization article, where they predict a dramatic decline in the population starting in the year 2030, when they predict an all-out global collapse economically, food, resources-wise, and otherwise driving a larger population decline. And they say it's an emergency, therefore the only way to avert it is to buy into this global government scheme. Uh, and so you've got the Club of Rome, a eugenicist oligarchical meeting group, pushing for this 40 years ago. You've got Paul Ehrlich with a population bomb pushing this 40 years ago. And it all ties into what we see this year, this convoy of United Nations vehicles and other NGO vehicles all trying to take us down the same road to global government to save us from ourselves, to save the earth. And so let's look at some of the quotes. Where are they trying to go with a globally run uh, population program? Well, we have to look no further than EcoScience, which is Paul Ehrlich, named in this article, who is part of these quotes, and John P. Holdren, who's the White House science czar, who we've covered at length. Coerced fertility control, they write in EcoScience, the development of a long-term sterilizing capsule could be implanted under the skin and removed when pregnancy is desired. It opens additional possibilities for coercive fertility control. They want to keep everyone from breeding unless you're authorized. Indeed, they go on to say, it's been concluded that compulsory population control laws, even including laws requiring compulsory abortion, could be sustained under the existing constitution. They're talking about the United States of America, folks. If the population uh, can't be brought under control, they go on to say. There's even more quotes from EcoScience, and here's where they begin to get into how we need a planetary regime, a global government, in other words, to regulate population. What do they say? Perhaps those agencies combined with the United Nations Environmental Program, the very group named in today's article, and the United Nations Population Agencies, of which there's a few, might eventually be developed into a planetary regime, sort of international super agency for population resources and environment. This should sound very close to the Club of Rome's proposals and these studies coming out of MIT where they say because of diminishing resources, because of them not embracing alternatives, that's going to trigger a population decline. So Ehrlich and Holdren go on to describe the planetary regime or the world government they want to set up. Such a comprehensive planetary regime could control the development, administration, conservation, distribution of all natural resources, including food on the international market. What are they talking about? They're talking about restricting access to food to control the population. It goes on. The planetary regime might be given responsibility for determining the optimum population for the world and for each region and for arbitrating various countries' shares within their regional limits. They're talking about giving food rations uh, in proportion to the population. And what will they do if you don't have 
If you have too many people in the population, you won't get the food. It goes on because this is an older idea. Bertrand Russell espoused virtually the same idea in 1953, long before Ecoscience came out. An International Food Authority, Bertrand Russell writes, could be used to deal with this problem of increasing population and decreasing food supplies. It will be necessary to find ways of preventing an increase of world population. And he goes on. If this is to be done other than by wars, pestilence, and famines, it will demand a powerful international authority, basically the same as this planetary regime they're talking about. The quote goes on. This authority should deal out the world's food to the various nations in proportion to their population. If any nation subsequently increased its population, it should not on that account receive any more food. The motive for not increasing population would therefore be very compelling. And what a dangerous hunger game it is. Henry Kissinger says almost the same thing in his National Security Memo number 200 in the early 70s about food as a weapon. Family planning performance and population control should be taken into account for appraisal of assistance requirements by USAID. USAID, they're talking about administering food to developing world nations and withholding food if they don't curb their population. And it goes on, would food be considered an instrument of national power? Is the U.S. prepared to accept food rationing to help people who can't or won't control their population growth? So when you see Ehrlich, Hansen, Lovelock in today's article, if we could go back to that graphic about how we must build an entirely new kind of global society, they are talking about building up such a world mechanism that you could save the environment by controlling population and especially by controlling food. After all, that's what MIT and the Club of Rome say is going to be the downfall of humanity is when the food resources run out, when the energy runs out, and on and on. That will trigger a decline in the population. The problem is it's all manufactured by these elitists, and they've been developing this agenda for at least half a century, really more than a century, and it's just sickening. And it's all in the news this year, in the past few days, in the past few weeks, trying to sell you on it. And I say don't buy it. And finally, tonight in the news segment, we're about to interview John Corbett, who exposed over a month ago the failure of the body scanners. He demonstrated how you could sneak objects through undetected. That has only been more confirmed as he's now talked with a witness, an employee, a whistleblower from the TSA, uh, who he calls Jennifer here. We won't use her real name. He has it. We don't. Uh, in the article by Paul Joseph Watson, TSA whistleblower, body scanners routinely fail. And it's her discussing how routinely, when they test machines in real life cases, people are able to get through with undetected objects, some of them metallic, some of them objects similar to or likened unto a wallet. You can see that all on his video. We'll show you just a clip of it here where when she complained to TSA, they began to procedure against her and tried to run her out of the job, even though she demonstrated that there's insufficient training, especially for the body scanner uses. You wrote to Congress about the problems that you saw in the TSA. I did. Um, what happened? Um, I sent my letter on January 1st, and I came back from sick leave about a week later, and I was immediately removed from screening duties. Okay, so you, you sent a letter to, to a, a congressman or to several mm -hmm. um, saying, hey, there's a problem with the TSA, and mm -hmm. the TSA's response was retaliatory, would you say? Yes. They, was that, was that the end of your screening duties? Have you been back to screening since? No. This is why the TSA sucks, because good employees who point out when the public is being put at risk aren't listened to, they aren't promoted, they're fired. The TSA spouts off on their blog about the professionalism of their employees, just as when they're caught on video molesting children at airports, they defend their employees' fondlings as by the book. That book being the Screening Checkpoint Standard Operating Procedures, or SOP. The SOP is the TSA's secret guide as to how TSA employees are supposed to do screenings at airports. The only problem is TSA employees never actually read that book. Supposedly there is um, an SO a standard operating procedures manual on every checkpoint. I've never seen it. So you wouldn't know where to go to find no. this book? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know, you can't make this stuff up. And so with more on the TSA body scanner issue, we turn now to John Corbett, who has done a lot of investigating on this and has a, the brand new interview you just saw clips from. Thanks for joining us, John. 
Thanks for having me. Uh, so briefly recap your own experience with testing out and investigating the body scanners, and then let's get into what this new interview shows. Sure. Last month, I tested the body scanners by um, essentially taking objects through the scanners in a position on my body uh, in which the scanners wouldn't be able to see them. And it actually works out to, to simply being right on your side, either left or right side. As long as it's on the extreme side and it's metal, it's not going to be visible. Um, so I, I, I tested it with both kinds of body scanners. The TSA is using now both the millimeter wave and the x-rays, uh, and was allowed to proceed both times with, with these undetected objects. It's just totally insane, but they make everyone go through them, even though they're known to be ineffective. But now, of course, uh, as we just saw the clips, you've confirmed this with a TSA employee. Let's get into that story. Correct. So since, since I uh, posted that video, and even before then, actually, since my lawsuit got filed a year and a half ago, I've had um, TSA screeners occasionally contact me telling me stories um, from things such as... Um, Screeners rip up comment cards when people leave angry notes to uh, stories of theft to, um, you know, the, the body scanners and the pat downs. And, and I was lucky enough to have one of them willing to go on camera with me for an interview um, regarding the, the efficacy of the scanners. And she, of course, admitted that they really kind of ignore known problems. They don't have adequate staff. And, and then you told me behind the scenes they like to avoid body scanner duty because they know it's ineffective. They know it's dangerous and they know the public doesn't like it. Correct. They, they told me they even go so far as to fail training exams uh, that the TSA gives them uh, in order to avoid uh, being able to be put in those lines, even though the TSA seems to put people in the lines that aren't certified anyway. That's just absolutely bizarre. And specifically, she said they've done tests, uh, you know, where it's a TSA controlled test and they're bringing guns, knives, uh, powder meant to resemble explosives. And all that is routinely missed, although it's probably also sometimes found. But the key word Correct. is sometimes. <clears throat> Correct. And you can imagine being a, a TSA screener brought in for a training on this device and, uh, you know, taking a, a bag of explosive on your one side and a gun on the other side, walking through this machine and the machine says, OK, clear. Um, you know, I, I, I just can't I can't fathom what the reaction in the room must have been when these these you know, multi hundred thousand dollar devices um, failed to detect something that a, that a cheap metal detector would have. But, of course, the metal detectors have also failed to find these kinds of things. Uh, you've had the air marshals and other groups testing out those devices. None of it could be 100 percent effective. I mean, they just can't keep us safe, anything they do about it. So we may as well retain our freedoms since they're more valuable anyway. Correct. You know, nothing's 100 percent effective, but it, it's pretty difficult to sneak metal uh, thread items through a metal detector. Um, that, that takes some special skill. Um, to, to, to beat these new body scanners takes almost nothing. Uh, you know, the size of your body is just one place that, that they won't be detected. And uh, according to this TSA screener, sometimes things aren't detected no matter where you put them. Um, so it, it's, it's a big problem. Um, you know, the, the TSA has come, out, come at us with these machines saying that these invasions on our, our privacy are necessary um, because these machines will keep us safe. Um, you know, I, I don't agree that, that uh, trashing our constitution is ever necessary. Um, but uh, even if you're on the other side of that argument, the machines just don't keep us any safer. Now, the other side of the safety issue obviously concerns the radiation with these body scanners. Uh, we've discussed briefly, let's get more into it, how the employees themselves are concerned about it. In Boston, Logan, they had a reported cancer cluster. A lot of those TSA workers were obviously concerned. Uh, the agency didn't want to give them dosimeters, as I understand. Uh, so that issue's on the table. Passengers are concerned about radiation. Uh, let's, let's get into this issue. Correct. You know, as, as you said, the TSA has refused to provide those dosimeters to the to um, to the Transportation Security Administration's employees that are standing next to those scanners all day long. Um, you know, I, I kind of feel bad for them because, you know, as a passenger, I might go through a few times uh, a week if I'm a frequent flyer, uh, but they're getting scanned uh, through through the ambient radiation all day long, uh, every day. Um, so that's that's going to be a serious concern for them. The TSA does not put out um, specifications as to you know exactly how much these uh, scanners are recorded to be put out. Um, they don't regularly calibrate them, and they don't allow independent testing. Yeah, um, and now so they're saying Congress might make them test the machine someday. Right, and, and every time Congress asks them to test it, they test it themselves, uh, and we're, we're left to take the TSA's word for it. Um, there, there needs to be some serious independent testing of these machines, both for the safety, for this radiation, and for the efficacy. Um, you know, the, the TSA has this idea of keeping us safe by, by keeping things secret, um, but then it comes out that by doing so, all you need to do is, is put a metal object on your side in order to beat it. 
Um, you know, if these machines had been tested by by the community, by the the security community, that they wouldn't have got in with this vulnerability. Uh, but you brought up how you feel sorry for the TSA agents. I do too. I mean, they're sitting uh, in the case of the metal detectors and the uh, the luggage scanning machines about a foot away from a big rapist scan machine that says radiation danger, and they sit there all day for a whole shift. I mean, of course, they're the ones who are going to get hurt. And the government's got the study going back to at least 1998, obviously before 9-11 happened, showing that uh, at least one variation of the scanners would cause statistically about 100 deaths per year I mean at what point is this a far greater danger than terrorism itself absolutely and, and um, you know a, a lot of things that I interviewed uh, my TSA screener about didn't get put in and, and one of them is that the TSA screeners are all afraid to use these machines um, they, they really don't want to be there they don't like it and, and since the since the screen since the machines and the, the pat downs were implemented in uh, November 2010 um, the TSA has been held to work for for them um, so it, it's it's something to watch for, and and you know what happens when ten years later a whole bunch of screeners get cancer. What does the government say? You know, we're, we're sorry. It, it's it's no good. Uh, judging from what I've read from time to time on the TSA blog, I would say it's a lot of obscuring and covering up and, and even lying at times. But your source, Jennifer, she's been a TSA worker. They've tried to run her out of the agency. Uh, you released a short clip. It was, what, six, seven minutes. You said she talked even longer on camera. Uh, get into her situation. Why are they driving her out and, and how? And what else did she tell you? Sure. She, she's been, been driven out of the TSA essentially for writing to Congress about the problems that she found. Um, everything from being forced to use the screeners, uh, the scanners, without being properly trained and certified for them, um, being forced to pat down people's head uh, when it's clear that, that there's nothing there. I, I've heard travelers report um, being bald and still having screeners touch their head as part of the pat down process. Um, you know, management is generally not listening to anything that, that uh, you know, comes to it. Um, so, so the TSA, tr instead of trying to fix these problems, tries to, to uh, essentially hide the screeners that do it. Um, so she was recommended for termination and took her three months um, to go through that process. And today is her last day on the job. Hmm. And so what else did she tell you that possibly you're going to release in the future? Sure. More information about the pat downs. Um, the, the TSA has said that the, these, these pat downs aren't invasive, but she's confirmed for me that if done properly, they will actually be touching your genitals. Um, what else? Um, you know, the, the, the most important parts, I, I think I got in there, but there's, there's definitely a lot more on, on the pat downs and on TSA sentiment that, you know, maybe I'll release in the future video. But that's what's overall amazing to me. We know that a lot of passengers are upset. We know that civil rights critics are very righteously upset because it's a blatant violation of several constitutional amendments and our basic freedoms overall. But it's interesting to note that even the TSA employees are upset about this. And clearly, uh, TSA knows they're under siege. They know they've had to respond to your incident. They've had to respond to incidences about touching children, all kinds of things they have to respond to officially on their blog, even though it's an anonymous person who doesn't use a real name. Uh, they shut down the body scanners when there was a planned revolt November of 2010 over the Thanksgiving holiday. They know they're getting a pushback from the public. They're just trying to keep us overall unaware of that. What's your response? You know, it's an interesting, uh, you know, what do, what do you do when, you, when you've invested hundreds of millions of dollars, probably close to a billion by now, into these machines? Uh, and find out that the public doesn't like them, that they don't work, that they're unsafe. Um, the, the, the TSA's approach has been to kind of double down and, and to, to buy more of these scanners and to try and um, force us via propaganda to accept them. Um, I, I don't understand why, why they took it any further. These machines were fatally flawed. They knew it before they released them. Um, you know, they, they, they thought they could get one over on the public. Obviously, that didn't happen. Um, it's time for the TSA to fold their card and say, you know, we, we screwed up here. Yeah, well, I'm not going to hold my breath on that, but please do no. keep up your efforts and, and let's keep putting pressure on them to at least be honest, test the machines, and if they're going to put them in there, they at least need to be tested. I mean, for God's sake. But of course, they really shouldn't be allowed to violate our civil rights either. We should be able to travel in a normal fashion, but we'll see what happens. Yeah. John Corbett, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Take care. All right, and we'll be back after this break with Rob Dew, who will have Mike Adams in studio to 
discuss the latest on the unfortunate incident where the chicken farmer has lost his life thanks to government pressure. We'll be back. Thanks for watching the InfoWars Nightly News and consider subscribing to support us at PrisonPlanet.tv. Well, I think terrorism is being practiced on the residents of the city of Oakland because many of the uh, retired, in fact, retired teachers, retired military people have uh, informed me that uh, they, they understand what's going on and it's not anything that relates to humanitarian training whatsoever. This is a psychological, as we in the research community say, this is a psyops. They're preparing people for what is coming not what is being presented today. So you're saying they're preparing people to accept it with incrementalism? That is correct, like the old frog example. You know, you put the frog in the water and you just gradually continue to raise the heat on the water until the frog is cooked. And that's the way it works. The problem is that the local people, people in general, just will not take their heads out of the sand. I'm going to tell everyone I can, listen, we have a serious problem. And it's called a police state. It's called a police state. Let's go ahead and get to this. I mean, you want to see you know, what, what goes with, with, with FEMA camps like a horse and carriage. Troops, militarized police, training with the Army to take over your cities and towns. Let's go ahead and play this YouTube clip, Martial Law is Coming, from News 7 at 11. The scenario was a fake, but the pepper spray and billy clubs used to break up this riot were definitely real. Good evening, I'm Miranda Stevens. Whether it's terrorism, riots, or any major disaster, local agencies will be the first to respond. That's why Roanoke City wants its disaster training to be as real as possible. Jeremy Butterfield has more. It's supposed to look like a riot, and the scene at William Fleming High School had all the elements. I'm one of the rioters that the guard and the police force had to take down and arrest and did very successfully. <laughs> and then, see, you talk about this, and mainstream writes articles about me like I'm crazy, making up troops and troop deployments when it's the Army Times, the Army War College. Hundreds of newspapers have announced it, and then I say, hey, that's tyranny, and they go, shut up, Jones doesn't exist. Infowars story on illegal Tennessee checkpoint prompts action by governor. Friday, listeners pointed out local news saying the Army was going to be out, regular Army running checkpoints, searching citizens with police. The governor got called, our listeners called. The Wifa Police Department had plans to conduct a seatbelt checkpoint on Saturday, April 4th at Highway 64 within the city limits of Whiteville. The checkpoint was planned to be in conjunction with Homeland Security and the 251st Military Police in Bolivar. After learning about this, I contacted Representative Johnny Shaw, who represents that area, ask you about this. Uh, Representative Shaw, you, you looked into this, and can you tell me what you've learned and, and where this stands now? I, I can. Uh, actually, this has been canceled. Some calls were made to the governor's office about this on the, earlier today, this Friday. And, of course, the governor just simply said, I don't need another headache. <laughs> it was a bad idea in the first place. I mean, during this climate and this day and time which we live, can you imagine the army stopping you for a seatbelt check? You know? We'll follow up with you on that, sir, and find out what steps are taken to protect, uh, to see that something like this uh, is uh, the, the public is notified in the future. Definitely we will, because the public should have been notified if it was going to happen, and I'm going to make sure that I call all of the local authorities and ask them not to do this anymore, but if they should even attempt to, to make sure that they contact people like myself and make sure that people are notified as to what is going to happen. Uh, Representative uh, John Shaw just joins us for a few minutes. Representative from Tennessee, District 80. Sir, thank you for coming on with us. Sure, you're welcome. Thank you for having me, Alex. You bet. Now, we played the clip earlier of you on a local news station talking about Army checkpoints. Uh, mm -hmm. The governor found out, thanks to you and others, and canceled it. Can you just, in a nutshell, tell us exactly, uh, uh, specifically, what was going on? Uh, yes, I can. First of all, I, you know, I have got a check now. I don't have 
concrete facts, but I don't think the military has, first of all, any jurisdiction to be checking seatbelts. Uh, when you look at the fact of a military unit being out, uh, your, your daughter, my wife, or someone driving through a roadblock with all of these local officials, the army and everybody out there, I think it's just going to scare people to death. I think our local and state officials have the staff when needed to check seat belts uh, to do a seat belt check without the army getting involved and uh, i just don't think it's a good idea welcome back to Infowars nightly news i'm your host rob dew uh, aaron did the news part and had a couple interviews there and did a great job and now we've got a special guest in here mike adams the health ranger who just did the radio show this morning and we learned a a lot of new things we learned from Mark Potok from the Southern Poverty Law Center that there is no hate speech. It just never existed, even though that's what they use to go after people all the time. And also he covered a story that I want to get into real quick, and it's about this man, Andrew Wordis, who was in Roswell, Georgia, and the man ended up committing suicide um, over the fact that his house was going to be um, uh, foreclosed on, the, the city was coming after him for all these ridiculous code violations. They wouldn't give him any assistance, not doing what a city servant is supposed to do, but acting like a bureaucratic official. So with that, we're going to turn to Mike Adams, the health ranger. How you doing, sir? Hey, Rob. Good to join you, man. Yeah. A lot going on. A lot going on. So let's get right into the city of Roswell um, incident. Tell us a little bit about what happened. Well, first of all, Andrew Wordies is dead. He, uh, he set his house on fire with himself inside the house. He was driven to that by a total outrageous abuse of power of the local bureaucrats there in, in Roswell, Georgia, who violated all kinds of laws and, and, and his civil rights in many different ways to intimidate him and try to take his property. They even contacted the holder of his mortgage illegally and tried to get them to sell his mortgage, which they did. They sold it out from under him to a mysterious owner that we, we have not been able to identify who now owns his mortgage. Definitely not related to anyone in the city, I'm sure. Oh, of course not. Yeah. Of course not. not, not, like, not never, only it. in Austin does that happen. Right, right. Uh, and, and we actually have a timeline of these events. Let's roll that timeline real quick, and you could just kind of go over it. And, I mean, it's sure. really, it's a sad situation. Here's a guy well, raising chickens. A backyard That's really chicken farmer, doing. a car mechanic. This began several years ago. This has been go going on, for, well, from December 2008. You can see uh, there's our Friday Fright Night city code enforcer yeah. there. On the Vicky the Hunt, Mark Lee. <laughs> oh, yeah. my goodness. Yeah. Anyway, this, this goes on. There were some people in the city who tried to help him out. Others the said The mayor no. seemed to help, want to help the, him out. The mayor tried to help him. They changed the rules on him to try to criminalize his backyard chickens after the fact without allowing him to be grandfathered in. They caused his property to be flooded because they refused to maintain a culvert that then flooded his property. Then they condemned his property, and they had it declared a nuisance property because he had what they called dead organic matter on the property. Well, that's just compost. Yeah. That's like, if you, I compost on my property, I take chicken scraps, I put them out there, I mean, kitchen scraps, excuse me, right. because I have chickens too. <laughs> I take <laughs> chicken scraps, that would be bad. Yeah. I take kitchen scraps right. and put them out, outside to make the compost, and I also take care of chickens, I have goats. Uh, do goats uh, uh, poop on the property? Yes, of course they do, but in Roswell, Georgia, they call that a nuisance, wow. and they use that as a reason to put him in jail yeah. for code violations. And then from there, they, they foreclosed on his house, they took it over, and then I guess uh, in the end incident, which happened just li late last month, um, they came to evict him and he blew the house up. Well, there were some other things that happened too. When they threw him in jail for 99 days for the code violations that they claimed, they then announced in the local paper that we threw this guy in jail. Well, everybody in town knew that Andrew owned firearms and mechanics tools and other valuable items, so his house was then looted. And the city said, we'll send some police officers over there to take a look, but they, they didn't really protect him. His house was looted. By the time he got out of jail, he came back and he found that his guns were stolen, his auto tools were stolen, some of his farm tools were stolen, his chickens had been poisoned, his house had been vandalized or looted. They, this was part of what led to his you know, taking his own life. demonization effort is what it sounds like on the, this guy. The city, I believe, in, engaged in a criminal conspiracy to destroy this man's life, and they succeeded. They did. And what are they going to do with that property? They're probably going to sell it to one of their developer friends, or that's what they do in Austin. They, they get this stuff, they kick people out of it, say yes. it's no humans on it. Oh, but now we're going to put a high rise on it or an apartment complex. It just, it's magic. Well, that property appears on the city's map of what they want as a future green zone. Mm -hmm. 
Now, they, by the time people see this and go to the website, the city may cleverly change that map to yeah. try to say, no, it, no, it wasn't. But we, we've done the research, and it is in the green zone map. Well, let's go to a couple of these, co well, at least one of the code enforcement officials, as she likes to call herself, or she's the supervisor, Vicki Barclay. Let's get the overhead shot of this. Uh, we also have a graphic. But what I, what I find funny is on their website, it says... Um, the Code Enforcement Office works each and every day to ensure that Roswell remains safe and a desirable place to live and do business for all our residents and visitors. Blah, blah, blah. They do this through a fair and unbiased enforcement program, which corrects violations of Roswell City Code or writes new ones if we don't have a code that actually fits what we don't like you're, that you're doing. It seems clear that this woman, Vicki Barkley, is in the center of what I'm calling a conspiracy to intimidate, oppress, and destroy this man's life. Mm. Uh, they would selectively enforce code violations against him, but not others who exhibited the same behavior on their property. When a flood occurred, because the city failed to maintain their culverts, right. the flood eroded part of his property, so he brought in a bobcat to help repair and restore the soil. Who gave him the bobcat? I think it was the mayor. It was the mayor. Yeah, loaned him so the bobcat. You have the mayor who's on this guy's side who's trying to help him out. Which it usually, it, it's usually like that in these small town situations. Right. You have the mayor who's a normal, decent guy, and then this council of vultures and other <laughs> yeah, little vultures, petty bureaucrats. Creatures. Here's another Skeksy, KJ uh, G. Love, who was, um, she was a city administrator who was helped help kind of change the law so he couldn't have the chickens anymore, so they could rewrite that law. That's right. It appears that the law was specifically rewritten to target this one individual and put him in a state of violation that they could then use to escalate the situation, which ultimately led to his death. This is, this is the poison fruits right here of Agenda 21. This when you these people think they now have free reign to go in and just intimidate people and write new laws and kick people out when they find a piece of land that they want, and it's That's despicable. Right. It's absolutely despicable, and it saddens me in particular, Rob, because I believe that had we known about this man mm -hmm. and what was happening, uh, either at InfoWars or where I'm the editor of National News, we could have publicized this and prevented this man from dying. Yeah. Uh, InfoWars has saved many lives by shedding light on bureaucrats and tyrants who are threatening innocent people. And I believe that this man's life uh, being lost is uh, could have been prevented had we known in time and had we been able to take action in time and expose the criminal conspiracy that I believe was taking place by these city administrators. Well, all we can do now is may his death not be in vain, exactly. Andrew Wordis. We can you know get the word out, tell other people, maybe somebody who's going through the same thing now is going to see this and go, Matt, I need to reach out. I need to do something, you know. I'm going to put myself out on YouTube and, and expose these people because when you shine light on these cockroaches, they'll run for cover because they're in the wrong and they know they're in the wrong. That's why they're doing it with all this color of law stuff. They are counting on these individuals to not have the resources to be able to bring in national attention. Right. And oh, so they love the single old people. Right. That's, that's their favorite pr uh, victim to go after. That's their prey. They see that and they go, oh, we can get that. That's going to be easy. He won't put up a fight or she won't put up a fight and they love to go after veterans because they've done their duty and served their country. Especially veterans. And I mean, it's just, it's, it's really sick. Um, there's an article, it's on Infowars, but it's also at Natural News. City of Roswell, Georgia bullies Andrew Words to death over his backyard chickens, uh, you know, and you, you covered a story today about, uh, you know, they want to come after and kill people's pigs in Michigan. Well, yes, and there's a case, uh, Mark Baker mm -hmm. is the farmer there who put out a YouTube video and took a stand and he's alive today because of that. They were going to raid his farm on April 1 with firearms and shoot and slaughter his entire livestock and maybe even shoot him if he put up resistance. But they backed off. Mm -hmm. Why? Because attention was brought to this case from the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund. We covered it at Natural News. It's been covered elsewhere. Alex mm -hmm. Jones covered it on his show uh, like 10 days ago or so. The light saves lives. Yeah. So think. I just want you to remember this too, Rob, that what you do here every day I know you work hard, man, and I know it can be stressful, but I want you to remember that at the end of the day, you are li literally helping save lives from the tyrants by shedding light on the truth here of what's happening. Well, and that's what makes it worth it, and I'm happy to do it because I hate injustice, and I hate when bullies pick on the underdog. Absolutely. And, you know, I wasn't raised that way to take advantage of people, and I hate to see it happen, and it really, really pisses me off. Well, well, me too. And, yeah. and just, just to add, yeah. I raise backyard chickens, all right? I, I've, got, I've got goats. Yeah, clearly, yeah. right? Some kind of weird terrorist. 
um, if they can do this to him, oh, yeah. they could do it to me. You're next. They could do it to you or your right. family, anybody around Austin, anybody in Texas who's a farmer. They could just declare your property to be a nuisance zone, and they could come literally shoot your, your livestock and arrest you or even shoot you. And what gets me is these people are not producers. They're not makers of things. They are these petty little tattletale miscreants, yeah. you know, it's, it reminds me of the people when you're in school who were writing names on the board, <laughs> yeah, you know, right. they were the first one to stand up and go, oh, I'll write your name on the board. Right. I'm good. I'm with the system. Nazi you know? enforcers. And, oh, yeah. it's, it's, it's sick. Let's move on to one of our, our favorite whipping boys, uh, Monsanto, who's going <laughs> to sue the entire state of Vermont just because, um, well, they want to have a right to know genetically engineered food act. And that's what they're, it's H722. And um, they're going, apparently Monsanto is threatening to sue the state of Vermont. What can you tell us on this? Well, Monsanto is losing this war so badly about the right to know what's in your food that state after state has been putting forth legislation that would allow parents and consumers, all of us, to just know what's in our food, to be able to make an informed decision about whether we want to buy GMO food or non-GMO food. Monsanto sees that as the end of their entire GMO business, which is probably an accurate assessment. So they're in desperation mode now, threatening and intimidating an entire state in this case. And California is probably going to be next because there's a petition effort there to label GMOs. They're trying to intimidate the entire state into saying that if you dare allow this law to be put into action and allow consumers to be informed of what's in their food, then we're going to drag your state through the courts and cost you hundreds of millions of dollars in court fees, and your state can't afford that. So this is another case of corporate bullying of a, a state that's trying to simply allow its consumers to be informed. Now, could a state like Vermont say, you know what, we're not going to allow Monsanto products in our state? Could yes. they ban those products? Absolutely, they or could. Just say, you know, no weed killer, no Roundup. We don't want this crap in here, and we're going to blockade you, like the Trade Federation and, well, and Star Wars, if you don't, you know, capitulate. And, but the and, federal government would then probably intervene, and they would misquote the mm -hmm. Commerce Clause of the Constitution. Oh, of course. And actually, the original intent of the Commerce Clause was to uh, make sure that states could not erect illegal tariffs against interstate trade. So that might actually be one of the only appropriate uses if it were, were in a different context. Mm -hmm. But you can bet the federal government would cite the Commerce Clause to try to intervene and allow Monsanto to keep selling its products in the state. And, you know, that after w listening to what I just said, that might sound like a call, uh, you know, for like tyranny of the state. But, you know, the states are allowed to assert their rights. And if they're going to if they're being sued by these companies that the research is out there, this yes. stuff is not good for us. It's not. And they hide the research. They try to hide anything that lets people know and make an informed choice. Well, think about this. GMOs are the only product that I can think of that is only successfully sold because consumers don't know they're buying it. That's it. It is sold entirely on deception, disinformation, and, and sweeping it under the rug, so to speak. If foods were honestly and accurately labeled with their GMO content, 95% of consumers would avoid buying them. Right. And that would be the end of the GMO industry, which is what we need. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we don't, <laughs> we don't need these companies <laughs> preying on us anymore with... And, and, it's not even that the GMOs are any better. They're not. They, no. they take more pesticide, which, which is just poisoning us more, or they, they have all these reproductive problems, which is most likely intentional. Sure. Well, Monsanto is a lot like Obama, where Monsanto <laughs> made a lot of campaign promises just like Obama made mm -hmm. and then violated every single one of them. Well, Monsanto's so-called campaign promises were that these seeds would increase production, you would have to use less pesticide, right. uh, it, you know, increase yields, better nutrition, and so on. The opposite has been the case. Right. So just as Obama has said, let's have more secret prisons, let's sign the NDAA, let's raid medical marijuana clinics let's in California. Let's farms if we want. Exactly. Monsanto, uh, it, the, the facts have turned out that the crop yields are lower, the soil is killed off and dead, mm -hmm. crops cannot even grow very well after five years, the super weeds are taking over, you have to use more pesticides, more chemicals, which is killing the rivers and the streams downstream. It's a, it's a freaking it ecological pollinates. nightmare. Yeah, of course. It cross-pollinates, it ruins the genetic code of the agricultural industry in America. We're talking about a genetic assault on the future of America's agriculture. It's, and it's a big happening deal. Now. It's definitely happening now, and now it's coming after, and it's, it's killing the bees. I mean, that's, yeah. they're, they're finally, after many years of probably lackluster study, they're finally saying, well, you know what, it, it is... Uh, what, Cl Clothana night. How do you say that again? Well, it's in a class called neonicotinoids. Neonicotinoids is the class, yeah. and that's just one example, one chemical in that class 
of uh, chemical pesticides. By bear. Yep, by yeah. bear. Oh, a loving bear. Yeah, who sold <laughs> tainted HIV blood um, to the rest of the world. That uh, they exported former here from chairperson the of Bayer served time in prison after the Nuremberg trials for war crimes. Mm -hmm. That's a, a piece of history that people don't really tend to acknowledge, but that's part of Bayer's history as well. Oh. And so, what is that, how is it actually killing the bees? What is it doing to them? Is, is it getting them to where they're not knowing where their colony is, or? Definitely. Understand, these synthetic chemicals, these are designed to attack the nervous systems of insects. That's how they, that's their killing mechanism. Mm -hmm. When the honeybees are exposed to them, which is usually at low concentrations, low levels, it doesn't necessarily kill the honeybees. What it does is it disrupts their normal neurological function, which is a very complex, fragile system of navigation that actually tunes in to many environmental cues, sunlight, the angle of the sun, maybe even the Earth's magnetic fields. We don't even know sure. if that's part of it as well. But it's, it's a very delicate computer that's in the honeybee's little brains. Mm -hmm. And when that computer is disrupted by these chemicals and it throws off their navigation, they can't find their way back to the flower. They can't even find their way back to the hive. They get lost. They die, the colony collapses, and then the food supply begins to collapse. That's what we're facing now as the honeybees collapse. Yeah, I was actually, I shot this a couple years ago on the green belt. Go back to that footage. And it, it's, a, it's a honeybee that's, it's, I was touching it, I was trying to get it to move. It was just lost. not interested in doing anything but laying there. Well, think about it. If the honeybees get lost, we, the, the hum, human species, yeah. may be lost because our food supply ends. We can't pollinate. Uh, There's one thing we can't you do. Can, I mean, you we can, can try, but. but there are, you know, greenhouse owners who do it all by hand. Right. Talk about a labor-intensive business. The sure. honeybees, what they work for us for free. Yeah. You know, you can't replace that. I, I, there was a there was a cost at one time. That did, how much was that? Where they said this is how much it would cost to do what the honeybees are doing for nothing. Uh, probably hundreds of billions of dollars a year globally. Um, there are honeybee owners who will rent out their hives, you know, mm -hmm. for pollination. That that's been um, a, a traditional activity that mm -hmm. you see in agriculture. But now I've seen some American farmers have to bring in bees from places like Australia because that's where the, the colonies aren't yet collapsing. Hmm. So that, you can imagine how hugely expensive that is to yeah. airship honeybees from another continent to pollinate your food in America. Bees on a plane. Very interesting. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, let's move on to, uh, well, SSRIs. They're, you know, well, we had just had in Austin a 24-year-old, Brandon Daniel, was on Xanax and tequila and, and went to Home Depot and then, or no, it was Walmart and, uh, and killed a cop. Yeah. You know, and this is one of the many things that, that happens with these, uh, with these people taking on these SSRIs. And, um, you know, this is, this is a very growing trend. We got the, the active duty troops on them. We had the guy who went on the Afghan murder spree. Now he was right. being put on one of the, was this an amnesic drug he was on? Yeah, he um, would, no, he was on a combination. He was, yeah, okay. They do painkillers, they do sleep drugs, they do the, the memory hole drugs that they put soldiers on so they don't mm -hmm. remember the trauma that, that they went through. Instead of treating it, just cover it up. Right. Um, even, you remember comedian Phil Hartman? He used to be on Saturday Night Live. Yeah. He was a victim of a murder-suicide. on, on it, mm -hmm. He was on the antidepressant drugs, yeah. Wow. You go back to Columbine High School shootings. Yeah. Uh, obviously, the antidepressants, the SSRIs in that case. You got 90 percent of the shooters, I think. Oh yeah, it's it's a huge number. The and we have an epidemic of the psychiatric drugging of U.S. soldiers, as this graphic is showing. This is one that we put together. And yeah, these are really it, good. I like these graphics. Thanks, man. We're <laughs> we're we're just trying to keep up with Infowars. Um, <laughs> there we go. Look at look at what it causes: suicides, accidents, violence, and drug addiction. The soldiers are given a 180-day supply of all these psychotropic drugs, and then sent out into the field with all these drugs in their hands. And they barter them, they trade them, they, uh, some, they take too much, they lose them, they have mm -hmm. withdrawals. The most dangerous thing that you can do with these drugs is, is quit them cold turkey. Right. That's what causes a violent outbreak episode. So for anyone watching who wants to get off of these drugs, make sure you work with your physician or naturopath. Do it slowly, gradually over time. Don't quit cold turkey or you may just snap. And, and end up shooting somebody or shooting your own family member. Because the, these dr drugs cause you to dissociate from reality. Mm -hmm. So that young man who shot a police officer in Austin, he may not have even known what he was doing. He may have thought in his mind that he was playing a video game, yeah. an Xbox game, that involved a, a Walmart and some bad guys with guns, and he just thought he was playing a game. And later, he, you know, he might have realized what, what actually happened, but at that moment in his mind, he may not at all have been guilty of pulling that trig trigger and committing that crime. God, I mean, it, it's just, and this is a, all these are examples of the system and the lordships above us trying to 
come out with these panaceas. It's like, oh, here, just take this, you know, just do this. We're going to help you. All this is here to help you. And it, it's not. It's, it's always these, these so-called good intentions, which are usually motivated by profits and, and you know, stealing from people. This is clearly motivated by profit, the psych drugging of soldiers and children and adults in America. Yeah. And the, the real sad part about it, Rob, is that the, the scientific studies show that these antidepressants work no better than placebo. So there's, there's absolutely no benefit to them uh, compared to just mm -hmm. taking a sugar pill, let's say, or, or an olive oil pill. So the, the scientific fraud that pushes the pills, and then there's profit fraud that takes place, and then the damage that the pills cause, such as the shooting of this, this police officer in Austin, who pays for that? Does the drug company pay for that? No. no. no of course they're, not. They're never at fault at all for, for creating this stuff, just like the vaccines. They're never, they can't be at fault for giving kids autism. Um, I was right. looking, I actually had my mom send me these pictures, and I, and I didn't bring in my phone with me, but from this... Uh, edition of National Geographic, they had a study with twins, and um, there's, there's a graph for identical and fraternal twins, and identical twins are more susceptible. If one gets autism, the other one is more likely to get it, too. And my wife brought this up because we're always having the vaccine debate at my house. <laughs> oh, really? Let me tell you. That be fun. And I fight it. I fight it very hardcore. And um, she came up and showed me this. She goes, well, what does this mean? How come the fraternal twins don't get it? And I said, well, you know, uh, identical twins come from the same genetic makeup, you know, the same egg. And whereas you get fraternal twins, it's two different eggs. So you have two different genetic makeups. So they're not as susceptible. Whereas, you know, if you look across the board, the identical twins are more susceptible to alcoholism. If one has, has the other get it, learning disabilities, right. uh, autism. And that's just because they come from the same genetic makeup. So they're probably getting the same other environmental factors that would trigger that. Yeah, absolutely. That's true. There is, there is some genetic susceptibility to the causes of autism, mm -hmm. which most undoubtedly include vaccine adjuvants. Okay the yeah. chemicals. But Alex actually hit on something huge the other day that I don't think has even been highlighted enough, which is that there's a, a whole new wave of vaccines that aren't even vaccines. They're not working on the antibody theory of uh, immune response. They are, in fact, nanotechnology brain-eating injections. Mm -hmm. they're, they're chemical lobotomies, but they call them vaccines. Right. So autism may be just the earliest example in our society of a, an injection with a chemical that eats part of your brain mm -hmm. or disables part of your neurology. Sure. Then in the future, they're going to target adults like you and me. Sure. People who speak out, right. oh, you have a disorder. People who think, of, think about conspiracies, hey, you probably have a disorder. Clearly. Well, they have it named. It's Obedience Defiance Disorder, ODD. Right. That, that's already in the DSM of the psychiatric manual. Oh, yeah. Restless leg syndrome. Right. Need a vaccine. You know, there's exactly. always going to be something to treat people. Mike, it's always a pleasure to Thank have you, you in here. Thanks a lot for coming, Good and I'm here. sure you'll be back many more times. And it's great having you here on in Texas and uh, fighting the fight with us and, and milking your Nigerian goats. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> happy to be here. Thanks all for right. having me on, Rob. All right. That's all of, all of our show today. I'd like to thank Aaron for sitting in and doing the news. Um, we're going to play uh, – well, I, uh, I guess we'll – you know, we're going to go out with a, our little – a um, little bit of videos from our contest submissions. So you can check those out. Our reporter contest is still running until the end of the month. I, um, you know, get your, get your entry in. We have, if you go to infowars.com forward slash reporter dash contest, you can see all the rules. There's only four rules to enter. We want to see what you guys can come up with, but we're really looking for that next Infowar. You could come in, sit here, sit where I'm sitting, do the news, probably more eloquently than I can. And, um, you know, and also go be sent out for reports do some video editing. I mean, we really are, we're doing multimedia. We're doing it the way it should be, fast, nimble, as quick as we can, with truth on our side. And uh, if you're not subscribing to this right now, prisonplanet.tv, please do so. It helps us out. It supports us, lets us buy more equipment, pay to get more people here, pay to fly people in. I mean, it's, it's the way we're doing it. So with that, Mike Adams, thanks for coming in. My name's Rob Dew, and this is InfoWars Nightly News. Christian Andrew reporting. This is Information Warfare. Today's topics, court hears arguments in lawsuit against Obama and definite detention law. Twitter, spamming celebrities, not okay. Advocating murder is fine. Here's the news. Judge asks government lawyers if NDAA can be used on ordinary citizens. A federal court in New York heard arguments Thursday for the preliminary injunction against the National Defense Authorization Act, also known as the NDAA. 
The bill signed by Obama that legislates for the indefinite detention of American citizens without trial. No habeas corpus. U.S. District Judge Catherine Forrest heard testimony from seven witnesses, including MIT professor Noam Chomsky, Pentagon Papers source Daniel Ellsberg, and Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, author, and Middle East expert Chris Hedges. Hedges himself filed the class action lawsuit claiming that the indefinite detention provision of the legislation, otherwise known as the Homeland Battlefield Bill, could see him sent to Guantanamo Bay for simply doing his job, and at the very least would have a chilling effect on the work of journalists and activists. Now that Ron Paul's heroic presidential campaign is drawing to a close, millions of liberty lovers nationwide are asking themselves what they can do to continue promoting his cause in a large-scale fashion. Well, I recently scored an exclusive interview with libertarian presidential nominee Gary Johnson, who says voting for him will help make major inroads for the movement. First promise I'm making if elected president of the United States is I promise to submit a balanced budget to Congress. Now, that isn't promising to balance the budget. That is promising to submit a balanced budget to Congress, which would be a $1.4 trillion reduction in federal spending. The next promise I'm making is I promise to veto any legislation where expenses exceed revenue. Um, Congress is going to end up overriding my veto. But I just suggest to you that with those two promises, spending will be lower than any other scenario that you could possibly come up with. Because submitting a balanced budget to Congress, a $1.4 trillion reduction in federal spending, imagine the debate and the discussion that goes along with a $1.4 trillion reduction in federal spending. The United States' sluggish economy and high corporate tax rate is also prompting the former New Mexico governor to lobby for tax reform. I am also advocating uh, on the part of the fair tax. Uh, I'm advocating throwing, or throwing out the entire federal tax system. So no more income tax, no more corporate tax, no more withholdings from your payroll check replacing all of that with the fair tax, which is a 23% consumption tax, which ends up being cost neutral over a very short amount of time. It's really the answer to making American goods and services competitive. It's the answer when it comes to exports and China. And in a zero corporate tax rate environment, if the private sector does not create tens of millions of jobs, I don't know under what case the private sector would create tens of millions of jobs. According to the Commission on Presidential Debates, third-party candidates can appear on the same stage as the Democratic and Republican nominees if five pre-selected polling organizations have them polling at 15 percent or greater and if they are on enough state ballots, which Gary Johnson is. Despite the media blackout Gary Johnson is experiencing, respected polling firm PPP currently has him polling at 7% nationally and at over 20% in his home state. Over here in the United States, we are the worst pushers of this because this is where Monsanto's based. And our food czar currently, Mike Taylor, used to be Monsanto's lawyer. He is also responsible for the reason why genetically modified foods, or GMO, monster Franken foods, made in the lab, are not labeled. He was then went from being Monsanto's lawyer over to the head of the FDA. He's the single person who made the decision not to let GMOs be labeled. Well, there's been a groundswell of people all across the country and world that do not want these genetically modified foods. They're damaging not only to the people, they believe they're hurting the bees and killing the bees, but they completely decimate the organic and natural environment. So basically, California and Vermont right now are trying to get labels um, made mandatory on genetically modified food. But Monsanto is, is literally threatening to sue the state of Vermont. And you can bet he'll come after California, too, because he went after Ben and Jerry's to stop them from labeling their milk not having certain hormones. So this is a typical 1% monster, Monsanto. He's one of those, one of those companies that is power-broking 
all the governments around the world. And now they've gotten Whole Foods to surrender. Whole Foods has just decided that they're going to get into bed with Monsanto. So your food is no longer going to be purely organic at Whole Foods. So I highly recommend boycotting them um, because if you think that you're getting organic food, you won't be. The media has been going hysterical about this situation. Trayvon Martin was, of course, um, killed by um, the suspect who is known as uh, what's his name? Uh, George Zimmerman. Now, we only know what we have been told. The news media does not have accurate information who actually report on the case fully. There has been numerous blurbs and uh, this and this and different things pinpointing things at Zimmerman, pinpointing things at Trayvon Martin. What really needs to happen is this case needs to go to trial and the truth needs to come out. I know the media is trying to build up this whole thing about black, white, or Mexican or some race war, but the thing is all of this is deception and all this is just used as uh, hysterical and mass hysteria to stir up the population. This is nothing but another tactic that the global elite and that the prostitutes have been using for a long time. You see, every day inside America, white people are killed by black people. There are some black people who are killed by white people, Asians and Mexicans and so forth. The case is, it shouldn't be about race. The case is, it should be about was this young man murdered by an individual who did not have the right to vote. When speaking to independents and liberals, I always hear that they wish they had a viable alternative candidate. How is it that this phrase keeps turning up? Well, most likely it's the result of the branding and the use of buzzwords in the media. Alternative candidates are always surrounded by the use of keywords that brand them, uh, their names and their movements. Regardless of how popular their viewpoints are, people are always told that they just don't have popular support. The establishment machines go to work to diffuse any potential movements before it starts. We were told that a vote for Ross Perot was a vote for Bill Clinton that a vote for Ralph Nader and Ron Paul in 2008 was a vote for Barack Obama. Now, through the internet and the use of social networking, users of the internet have the ability to see that there really is popular support out there, that they're not alone. And the mainstream media has had to go into propaganda overdrive to counteract this momentum. In 2008, Ron Paul was completely ignored, but this time it's impossible to ignore him, and so they resort to slander. free energy technology could in theory permanently immunize us from those harms. So what can we do? How do we fight? It's obvious to me that we use the weapons of the globalist against them. By raising awareness through the internet and financially supporting worthy causes like the Ron Paul campaign, PrisonPlanet.tv, The Resonance Project, and others. I'm afraid the time is drawing near. Now at the same time there is an obvious awakening on a global scale which no doubt the globalists fear. So Info Warriors, what is it going to be? Sit there and hope that someone else does something about our obvious dilemma? 
or do something with the little time we have left. Continuing to ignore this problem will no doubt lead to the imminent takeover of the little constitutional rights we have left. There will be a time when the police state is so obvious, so powerful, so overwhelming, that resistance at that time could prove futile. And sense of community that allows them to build complex societies. But the analogy goes deeper. Humans and ants both face enemies that seek to destroy their way of life using similar tactics. We need to do this every day of the week and just really brainwash people. The Ignuman Wasp is a particularly dangerous enemy to ants because of the type of warfare it uses against them. When the wasp enters the colony, ants immediately begin attacking them to defend their queen. But the wasp emits a chemical that causes the ants to begin fighting amongst each other, distracting them from the real enemy. As humans, we must remember that an imagined or scapegoat enemy can be used to create fighting, while the real enemy lays its plans in plain view. The wasp will lay its parasitic egg in the colony, as the ants are hopeless to defend against it. You must keep in mind as you make your fight, is it the cause of liberty and justice, or is it an imagined fight designed to distract you from the true enemy?